Yeah, sure. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello. Good morning. Up a little bit. How do I? Good morning. Is that better? Oh, great. <laughs> Welcome back to uh, the Summer School 2016 uh, with the Addictions Lecture Series. Um, thank you for coming. It's all lovely, uh, it's lovely to see you all again. Thank you for your emails, some of you. Uh, they were very interesting to hear your comments and your thoughts. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, my colleagues have said, please can you turn off your cell phones or turn them down or put them on vibrate, whatever you prefer. <laughs> um, and uh, and we'll, we'll begin. Um, any questions then? So, so the the format of this morning, we've only got an hour, sadly. So uh, Mike and I are going to share this um, session. So you'll have half an hour with me, and then half an hour with with Mike. And for my session, um, the the title is Any Questions. Uh, so essentially, um, I gave you some homework, um, and uh, I'm sure I can feel you all. Uh, bending into the weight of this paper because when I read it also I found it quite heavy but <laughs> so don't worry but I did that deliberately because um, there's nothing like throwing yourself in at the deep end is there it can only get better <laughs> so um, so I hope some of you've been able to read it through a little bit and use the lecture uh, notes or the slides I can send you also the slides um, as a kind of gauge yes if anybody hasn't ha got access or had a, a copy of the slides yet please email me um, and I can um, I can give you a copy of those I'll put the lecture slides up again at the end with my um, with my email address so um, <clears throat> first of all hands up so it feels a bit like school doesn't it but it's summer school hands up how many of you actually read the paper <laughs> Not all, half of it, okay. If yeah, <laughs> well, let me tell you something. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years now on neuroscience, and I only read half of it as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it's, but uh, the, the last part is very heavy. I actually skipped the end part, which uh, also talked about conclusions and future directions. But I think the, the most useful parts of this um, paper or well, the introduction, uh, with some nice um, schematic diagrams to explain some of the things that I went through in the lecture. And, um, and, and there's a part halfway through on um, novel treatments. So, you know, the treatments of, um, uh, of addiction. And then at the very end, oh, it's disappeared. And then at the very end, um, oh, what's happened? The computer doesn't like it either. <laughs> It's catching up. It's too heavy for the computer, even. <laughs> uh, let me try and open it again. How's that? Uh, whoops. Oh, no, I've lost it now. Oh, here it is. Oh, there we go. Um, so, yeah. So, so probably the, the best parts of the paper, I think, were um, the, the introduction and the, the final parts, uh, which talks about the novel treatments uh, and the conclusions. And for those of you that haven't read it, and um, I hope this doesn't bore you too much, but I'm just going to reread the abstract for you guys, for those people that haven't had a chance to read it yet. And then I'm going to open up the floor to you guys. I want, to, I want you to um, ask me any questions. And then those people that are listening, you know, maybe. Um, jot down the question that the person asked and then um, jot down some of the, the answers that, that, that are given. And also, just before we start, um, I can um, really heartily recommend you looking at a website called PubMed. P-U-B-M-E-D. P-U-B for public. P-U-B-M-E-D. Uh, PubMed. All one word. P-U-B-M-E-D. If you just search in Google, PubMed, uh, you'll get um, the NCBI website, which is the national, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's the, the College of um, Science something. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you log on to this, it will give you uh, all the published articles in, in science from any kind of uh, area. And if you, in the search bar, type in things like addiction or DLPFC and addiction, it will come up with, in chronological order, all the papers that have been published on that area that you're interested in. Now, sadly, if you're outside UCT, you'll probably only get access to the, to the abstract. But often, as you'll see, 
you can get quite a lot of information, enough information uh, uh, to find out what you're, what you're looking for. So PubMed, and use the search bar to search for things like addiction, DLPFC, uh, treatments, um, neuroscience of addiction, and it will give you lots of, of information. So, without further ado, before I open up the, the, um, the, the um, audience uh, for questions, let's read through the abstract. So this paper is written by um, a gentleman, a professor who's very prominent in the field, uh, Barry Everett. He's based at Cambridge, and he's uh, quite a, an old uh, gentleman now, but he's done a lot of work in addiction neuroscience. <clears throat> And he has written this paper that he, it's based on a talk that he gave at a conference. And it's actually um, giving some hypotheses because, uh, about addiction, because actually we don't really know uh, enough about addiction to be able to uh, treat it yet. That's the, the kind of, um, uh, good morning, Lara. <laughs> uh, that's the, the kind of take-home message that we still don't know enough about how the brain functions, particularly in substance use disorder, to be able to treat it effectively to prevent relapse and um, improve treatment. So he's uh, proposing a, um, a hypothesis here. So this is the abstract for those of you that haven't read the paper. This review discusses the evidence for the hypothesis that the development of drug addiction can be understood in terms of interactions between Pavlovian, so classical conditioning, and instrumental, Skinnerian operant conditioning, uh, instrumental learning and memory mechanisms in the brain that underlie the seeking and taking of drugs. Okay. It is argued that these behaviours initially are goal-directed. So there is some aspect of control in, in addiction, that these behaviours are initially goal-directed, but increasingly become elicited as stimulus-response habits by drug-associated conditioning stimuli that are established by Pavlovian conditioning. So it starts off as a controlled um, intention to take the drug. You don't feel impulse, impulsive. You think you make the conscious decision to take the drug, whatever it may be, um, cigarettes, alcohol, or, or illicit substances. And then over time, uh, environmental stimuli um, start to elicit these Pavlovian-type conditioned responses that cause you to be compulsively driven. You can't stop thinking about the drug of, cho of choice. So then you, you start compulsively habit-forming and, uh, and seeking the drug. It is further argued in the paper that compulsive drug use emerges as the result of a loss of prefrontal cortex inhibitory control over drug-seeking habits. What specific, here's a quick question to you guys to see if you're listening on Monday. What specific brain region of the prefrontal cortex is most associated, do you think? Can you remember? The DLPFC, exactly. I heard dorsal and lateral in the, in the that's right. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in, in particular. But it is a network, so it doesn't function on its own. <clears throat> so that's this part of the brain here. Uh, um, data are reviewed in the paper that indicate that these transitions from use to abuse to addiction depend upon shifts from ventral, so that's the nucleus accumbens, to dorsal striatal control over behavior. Mediated, so that, that's controlled dr drug use, controlled reward um, seeking, to compulsive habit forming. Mediated in part by serial connectivity between the striatum and midbrain dopamine systems. So other midbrain dopamine systems include the amygdala, um, and the hippocampus and, uh, and those, those regions. So only some individuals, though, lose control over their drug use. So not everybody <coughs> um, regresses down that spiral to compulsive dr drug use. Some people in life can continue to take drugs, alcohol, nicotine, illicit substances, uh, you know, at will. They can take it or leave it. But some people do get hooked. And the importance of behavioral impulsivity as a vulnerability trait, remember impulsivity is knee-jerk reactions, whereas compulsivity is more 
taking over your thoughts. So the importance of behavioral impulsivity as a vulnerability trait predicting stimulant abuse and addiction in animals and humans, together with consideration of an emerging neuroendophenotype for ad addiction, are discussed. Whoa. That's quite complicated. But essentially, you know, it's gene by environmental interaction. So if you've got genetic predisposition to be impulsive and you find yourself in an environment that perhaps creates stress for you or that you've had a traumatic experience at some point, then it might tip you into this spiral from con con uh, controlled drug use to um, compulsive drug use. Finally, the potential for developing treatments for addiction is considered in light of the neuropsychological advances that are reviewed, including the possibility of targeting drug memory reconsolidation and extinction to reduce Pavlovian influences, that's habitual influences, on drug seeking as a means of promoting abstinence and preventing relapse. Now, that's slightly different to uh, cognitive training, which is also, we mentioned in the lecture on Monday, about memory, but it's, there's two ways that you can affect memory, I think, in, in addiction. That's memory reconsolidation, so that's more like contingency management, where you, sac you substitute the desire to take the drug for a desire for a pro-social reward. So you're substituting the desire to take the drug for a better reward by giving vouchers and things like this. Whereas, so that's targeting the reward circuit, the midbrain circuit. Whereas an, a treatment using cognitive training, working memory, for example, is using that top-down system, suppressing uh, the desire to take the drug. So that's the paper in a nutshell. And I love this. Um, diagram because I think it really summarizes what he's talking about in this paper. So I'm going to stop talking now uh, and I'm going to put the, the, the questions over to you. So any questions? <laughs> yes, Rose. Good morning. find my, I'm going to use the board, I'm going to be very old fashioned, I was going to write down your questions. <laughs> I haven't used chalk for ages, blimey. Uh, okay, so your first question was, uh, your first question? Well, it's related to the, your assumptions about there being a genetic predisposition to impulsivity. A genetic predisposition to impulsivity. Question mark. Yeah. And the second question? Well, it, it just relates to um, you, you're assuming that there is such a thing and that one can define impulsivity. Yeah. So, can we define impulsivity? And that it is a preconditional trait. For addiction? Yes. So, a precondition. Impulsivity for addiction. Okay. I hope you can read my scrawly writing. <laughs> All right. So, well, let's take the first um, point that Rose um, mentioned here. And please keep me on time. Um, I can only talk about what I've learned uh, in, my, in my time in this. And... I come from, as I said, a background of anxiety, um, anorexia and um, eating disorders. 
But we've started to look at certain genes that may or may not be related to this frontostraital circuitry, which is highly implicated in um, uh, impulsivity and attention deficit disorders. Um, so to answer this question, I'm going to tell you some of the studies that we've looked at from different cohorts. But before I do that, some of the genes that are implicated in a, in a predisposition to impulsivity are the following. The first one is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. Now, BDNF is very interesting because um, it helps um, with um, uh, neuronal um, growth in the mesolimbic pathway. And the other interesting thing, so it's, you think of it as roots of a, of a plant sprouting. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor is quite ubiquitous acro across the brain, the whole brain. But specifically, um, during development, it helps to sprout the mesolimbic pathway. The other thing, if your mother, when she is pregnant with you, is stressed and she releases a lot of cortisol, can actually suppress the expression of BDNF in the developing fetus which is very interesting. So it could be, and there's a, a link to BDNF suppression and eating disorders, in that when you are born uh, and your mother had a release of cortisol, you've got less, um, uh, for want of a better word, um, activation in the mesolimbic pathway, which could predispose you to become anhedonic, so not very reward-seeking. Um, not, not particularly reward-seeking or, you know, not uh, less um, reward-driven. And there was a question on Monday that somebody gave me, which was, you know, uh, are there temperamental differences? And I do believe there are. So, you know, some people could have a very active mesolimbic pathway, that midbrain system, <clears throat> and others may have less. And it could be this BDNF suppression, um, uh, expression. So that's one... Uh, link to impulsivity or compulsivity uh, and perhaps people that are prone to addiction have got a greater expression of BDNF. The other um, genetic uh, susceptibility, and there are obviously many, many, and in the field now there's something called GWAS studies, um, uh, gene, genome-wide association studies, thank you, um, genome-wide association studies where they look at all the genes that they can sample from the blood and they see which ones are most uh, associated as opposed to candidate brain regions where you as a researcher you say oh I'm really interested in that one gene like BDNF and then you go down that but that's you you, um, you know you conduct your research looking at that one gene now that's obviously biased according to the researchers interests so GWAS studies are much better but um, these genes that I'm going to tell you about are, have, been, uh, um, have been found, I think, by these GMAS studies. So the other gene that's uh, associated with impulsivity is COMPT. <clears throat> and I'm going to try and spell it for you, but it's catalomethyltransferase. <laughs> C-O-M-T, just put C-O-M-T. Um, and catalomethyltransferase actually breaks down, so it dismantles dopamine, <clears throat> particularly in the prefrontal cortex. Now, as you saw on Monday, dopamine gets released into the prefrontal cortex by those frontostraital pathways. And <clears throat> there's actually a theory of schizophrenia that if um, too much dopamine is broken down in the prefrontal cortex, there's not enough dopamine left swimming around for there to be a good executive control network function going on. So you can't do working memory if you've got schizophrenia, for example. And that's important because people that take too much tick can get um, psychosis. They get substance-induced uh, psychosis. So there possibly is a link. Now, COMPT, <clears throat> going back to that, it's, a, it's a, an, an enzyme that breaks down dopamine so that it can be re-uptaken into the neurons and, and repackaged and re-released. <clears throat> now, if that happens um, too, too much, then uh, there's not going to be enough dopamine for the, um, the executive system, the working memory system, to work. 
And if that's the case, if there is a combination of too much dopamine being released onto the prefrontal cortex and too much breakdown or, or an inefficient breakdown by COMPT, then this frontostraital circuitry is going to break down. And then it's going to lead to a genetic susceptibility for <coughs> impulsivity. Now, of course, if you lead a life, you know, a sedate life where you're very happy and there's no need to use your prefrontal system, you're not getting aroused particularly, then you're not going to see this um, phenotype, this behavior of impulsivity. But if you then, for example, move from the peaceful country into the city and then suddenly you're bombarded with all these new things that you've got to learn, suddenly your genetic susceptibility is going to show itself because you're going to have too much activation of the mesolimbic pathway too much dopamine coming onto the prefrontal cortex, too much or an inefficient breakdown by COMT in the prefrontal cortex, and bang, then you're impulsive. Then you start to, to break down and you see it in, in the behavior. So I could go on and talk about other um, genes, but those are my two favorites, I have to say. So do look at PubMed. I have, I have to um, really um, uh, mention that. And, uh, and COMPT and addiction and BDNF and addiction. There's a gentleman there with a question, yes. What evidence is there that uh, addiction runs in families? I think it's quite strong, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's, it's, we, we estimate that about sort of the heritability of... Oh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we it's estimated that about 50% uh, of sort of the heritability of substance use disorders is genetic, but then that also means that 50% is environmental as well. So this idea of sort of nature versus nurture um, in leading someone to become a substance user or a substance abuser um, is, is is pretty much that. There's a sort of very very tense. Um, interplay and dance, I guess, between nature and nurture. And we see that from twin studies. So quite often, um, you know, we, we can gain a lot of information from twin studies because those two individuals say, share exactly the same genetics. And what we see from twin studies or adoption studies where twins have been adopted into different families is we see that there are certainly correlates that suggest that there is a shared genetic susceptibility. But that being said, not every identical twin pair where one uses substances, the other one doesn't necessarily use substances. So I think that adds sort of more evidence to the fact that there's more going on here than just genetics. So it's about 50-50. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> So yeah, so the second question, I hope that answered your question. The second question is, um, how do we define impulsivity? Well, I'm just going to briefly um, go back to what I said on Monday, which is the difference, and it's on the slides, you know, the main difference between impulsivity and compulsivity is that impulsivity um, in, is defined in the, in the literature or in the fields as a kind of knee-jerk, non-conscious, automatic um, response. You, you know, afterwards, you, you can consciously... Um, process what you've done like if you're a binge eater if you have bulimia and you've raided the cupboards for that sort of five minutes or so when you're raiding the cupboards it's very impulsive but i understand though that the that the root can uh, you know the thing that precipitates that impulsive behavior might be more conscious and it might be a decision but it's almost like from a subjective point of view i'd, I'd say that it's like a rising up of and then suddenly i mean the the people with um anorexia, they gave me a great anecdote when I was doing my PhD that stuck with me. And this one, I mean, I learned more talking to the patients than I, than I did probably reading the books. <laughs> but um, she, this one particular girl said to me, you know, it feels like, and it, this was her compulsion, uh, holding down a lid. Okay, so this is a great, I, I've got coffee in this cup, but you don't know how much coffee I've got left in this cup. Could be completely gone, it could be full. And the coffee in the cup represents the mesolimbic pathway, the reward um, circuitry. And the people with anorexia, they're holding down this lid. This is their compulsion. They're afraid to open up the lid uh, and it'd be like a jack-in-the-box scenario. You know, if they, if they take their hand off the lid, which is the prefrontal cortex control, then they're scared that their emotions and their appetite is going to spill out um, and over, overrule them. Now, the, the impulsion is this um, lack of control, almost, this knee-jerk reaction. Um, and it is difficult to define, but I think 
the best way to um, get to defining it is to look at lots of different cohorts. Um, so things like fetal alcohol syndrome, ADHD, OCD, these uh, substance use disorder, binge eating, they all have impulsivity built into their, um, the, the definition of the disorder. But, um, you know, what is it that's, that's similar? And it's this non-conscious, automatic, dorsal stratum uh, response to um, environmental stimuli. And that's why I think it's really useful to use neuroscience uh, in conjunction with uh, psychology to um, try and understand what it is that we're looking at when we're using these um, questionnaire measures and, and um, neuropsychological testing. Because when we do something, we see the behavior. The behavior can be quite complex. It can be uh, diluted by many different um, uh, sub-behaviours, if you like. But if you consistently see a brain region that's lighting up, you can start to get a picture that that brain region is perhaps associated with a very specific trait. And in this case, the dorsal stratum is quite consistently activated when you're talking about this thing, this concept. And I will say it's a concept because it's very tricky, called impulsivity. Now, before I go on to the final point, it is always difficult, I think, to define um, these concepts. For example, schizophrenia. What on earth is schizophrenia? I mean, it's, um, it's very difficult to define. I'm not a schizophrenia researcher, but um, there are many, um, and, and Mike does more schizophrenia research than me, so he's probably going to tell me off for <laughs> going down this path. But, but um, you know, essentially, it's got lots of behaviors that combine to cause this big umbrella term called schizophrenia you know, um, positive and negative symptoms for one. That's one way to define them, positive symptoms being the hearing voices, the auditory hallucinations, the, um, the arousal, you know. And then the negative symptoms are cognitive uh, uh, decline, uh, anhedonia, um, social um, disorientation, uh, negative effect, all these things that are, um, or, or apathy, nonverbal communication. So, um, it, I think these things um, are on a spectrum, so we, I think we all have these traits, but it's whether, and going back to the slides, remember I showed you that spectrum model of restraint versus impulsivity, and I think if you think of it in terms of being in the middle as a normal person, you've got some level of impulsivity, but it's if it tips over. Um, but yeah, it's very difficult to define impulsivity. <laughs> and then the final, because I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm running out of time, but I also want to give one more person uh, the chance to answer a question. So the final question, precondition uh, impulsivity to addiction. Well, I think I've kind of answered it in the sense that if impulsivity is related to frontostratal circuitry, the um, deficient activation of the frontostratal circuitry, uh, whether it be because of genetic susceptibility or environmental um, uh, impact, I think if you are, um, if you are vulnerable to um, be novelty seeking, to have an anxiety, um, um, to have a lot of anxiety, then I think it's going to uh, weaken your ability to uh, control or modulate from a prefrontal cortex um, scenario your uh, ability to control your addiction. So I think impulsivity, which then leads to compulsivity, I think is, is definitely, um, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely a, a big issue. Yeah. One last question, the lady at the top. Mm. Great, thank you for um, pointing that out. Now, um, methylphenidate, which is the, the, the drug, the Ritalin, uh, is, I, I mean, I'm, I was shocked when I first came to um, South Africa, and I think it's in America as well. Teenagers are readily prescribed, like it's like candy, uh, Ritalin. And apparently, I mean, it, it does improve your ability to do your exams, so people are actually getting it to improve their, their exam performance. Um, I 
probably you could guess I'm not a massive fan of pharmacotherapy, I have to be honest with you, because I think, yeah, you might get some, you know, you, uh, among other symptoms of taking the drug, you might improve that uh, symptom that you're trying to uh, control, for example, reduce impulsivity or improve attention, but then it can also lead to um, sleep uh, problems or depression or further anxiety or appetite, that's right. So um, I am much more in favour of um, cognitive training. That said, though, uh, I think some people are, might be so severely disordered that they might need a, a, a boost, you know, with pharmacotherapy plus some kind of um, psychological intervention like CBT. So I don't think ph uh, uh, pharmacotherapy is completely defunct, but I think... Uh, it's too readily jumped upon as a quick diagnosis, I think. Uh, but I'm not a psychiatrist. Or, so, uh, but um, one more last question. But just to finish on this, um, uh, one of my colleagues actually uh, has gone back to Canada. He did a very interesting study looking at methylphenidate uh, in, in exercise. He was based in uh, sports science with Tim Noakes. And they did a lovely fMRI study where they got people to do a hand grip. Uh, they, they got them to hold this hand grip for as the strong as they could and there was a bar on the screen that showed how strong they were holding this grip um, and they did this double blind crossover um, control trial which means that neither the experimenter nor the subject knew whether they were taking methylphenidate um, Ritalin or placebo but then they a week later they they switched so everybody got one or the other um, and they found that when the these people were given methylphenidate it improved the fatigue, so they were able to hold on for longer. Um, and obviously, you can imagine that they're trying to see whether they can use methylphenidate to improve, like, marathon runners' performance or whatever, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's a little bit tricky. So it does, going back to the very beginning, it does improve impulsivity. It does improve uh, this ability to control your, your impulsive uh, um, behaviours. And it also improves your ability to... Uh, to uh, um, modulate your um, your uh, motor responses to carry on for longer, which I think is the same. And fine motor control. Probably as well, I, I imagine, yes. So it would be interesting to see with Parkinson's or something whether this would also help, I'm not sure. But thank you, great question. One last question. Yeah. Giving, for instance, 15-year-olds or whatever, a drug to make them different... Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, again, I, if I had a 15-year-old, I probably wouldn't... I mean, I, I haven't got children, so I don't know how awful it must be to live with a child that really has got ADHD. I mean, um, but I would like to say from my position now that I wouldn't necessarily want to give a child a 15 when their brain isn't fully developed yet uh, methylphenidate. Um, I would rather try and do sort of more cognitive-based... Uh, approaches as we've talked about um, without shamefully plugging curb your addiction again. Oh, whoops, I just did. <laughs> uh, it's also a psychological thing behind it, which must be quite traumatic, I think. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, if you strengthen this cognitive um, machinery in the executive control system, the, the prefrontal system that's allowing working memory, that plate spinning scenario, then, you know, kids or people that are trying to deal with trauma can actually hold it in. It's like keeping hold of those things that you're trying to overcome for a bit longer until you can get over it and then relax again and do it again. So it is a bit like a, a marathon where you're trying to hold on for as long as you can uh, to, to deal with these negative emotions that might be arising. So yeah, I'm not a, a great fan of giving drugs to kids. Anyway, thank you so much. It's been really lovely to meet you all. And I'll hand you over. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thanks, Sam. Uh, just fiddling with this. Can everyone hear me at the back? Can you hear me at the back? Okay, just, a, just a, uh, while I'm getting setting up, just a, maybe just a comment on the methylphenidate story. Um, I think that amongst most of the drugs that we have in psychiatry, um, the sort of results from clinical trials are disappointing at best. Only about 50% of people will respond to an antidepressant, for example. Um, the people that are receiving treatment for bipolar schizophrenia regularly relapse and default medication. Um, the, the, okay. With ADD, um, what we actually have in ADD is that the sort of empirical literature supporting methylphenidate and treating ADHD is actually very, very strong. 
Um, it's probably some of the best literature, in fact, that we've got for any medication in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And what happens in ADD actually is there is sort of, and it ties in with what Sam was saying, is that there's underactivity of the prefrontal cortex because of low dopamine levels. And as a compensation for that, the individual becomes hyperactive. So the hyperactivity is actually a result of low levels of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. So what we're actually trying to do by giving um, young children stimulants is we're trying to boost the amount of dopamine that's in the prefrontal cortex, improving their attention and then reducing the hyperactivity and impulsivity. And this is actually quite important because what we see is that there certainly is a link between the tray of impulsivity, ADHD, and substance use disorders later in life and, and in adulthood. And actually what, we, what we've seen from studies is that children that were, first of all, correctly diagnosed with ADHD, and I think for the sake of the argument, let's just assume that all children are correctly diagnosed, but, but it's not the case, but let's just assume they are, is um, there is a significant association between the use of methylphenidate to treat ADHD and lower levels of substance use in adulthood. So it seems that in most children, who are predisposed to substance use by virtue of being impulsive and having ADHD, using methylphenidate correctly might actually reduce these people's risks um, of using substances later on in life. Um, and we certainly see that, but methylphenidate is, is, is definitely not without its controversies. Um, there's a lot of overprescription, there's a lot of off-label and off-license prescription, there's this idea of using methylphenidate and other drugs as smart drugs, as sort of cognitive enhancers, um, whether that's ethically right or ethically not right, no one really seems to know. I do think though that our evolution, which is ongoing, is going to be a cognitive evolution, so I think that in the next 50 to 100 years' time, we are going to be taking pills for cognitive enhancement, whether it's to think faster, read faster, write faster. It's just the sort of unstoppable pace, I think, of human evolution. And at the same time, there's also this technological evolution, and it'll be interesting to see how these sort of two things um, combine. So this idea of sort of methylphenidate in children and adolescents is very controversial. I must say, though, that um, amongst our division of child and adolescent psychiatry um, at, at, at Critis Geo Hospital and at UCT, um, they prescribe judiciously because the type of patients that they see at Red Cross Children's Hospital are severely, severely disabled from ADHD type of symptoms. It really is like, you can sort of see the stress on the parents and it has a very a sort of knock-on effect on the health and wellness of the parents and of the family and also on the child's scholastic progress. And in most cases, the benefits of the medication outweigh the risks. Although that being said, the drug is not without risks at all. But I certainly think that for adults, it's very controversial, very difficult diagnosis to make in retrospect to say, were you hyperactive when you were a child if, if, if it wasn't diagnosed? Um, but I certainly think that if anyone has um, got a child or knows a child that has got ADHD or has been diagnosed with ADHD, it's worthwhile to have a, an appointment, make an appointment with a child psychiatrist because quite often general practitioners and GPs do the initial diagnosis and they do the initial prescribing. But there's some other things that we need to think about, and sometimes it needs the sort of expertise of a subspecialist, um, especially when it comes to children's health and children's safety. So I think that's a, I, I hope that's a nice sort of diplomatic answer um, to, 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 to come across that. I'm a little bit biased, you know, I like pharmacotherapy, um, and I think in certain cases, pharmacotherapy can be very useful, but at the same time being realistic that uh, we do have this sort of culture of overprescription and overuse of medications. But um, what, what I'm going to talk about now is sort of more some, some sort of practical advice, if I can get this microphone right, um, in terms of how to actually access treatment for substance use. So I've had a couple of people email me after yesterday's talk as well, They're similarly so with Sam, and thank you very much for everyone's emails. I haven't really got a chance to get around to them yet for sending the other emails that I said I would send, but I will get around to doing it this week. Um, but if in case anyone just sort of missed my uh, email address, um, you can get it there. It's info at drmikewest.co.za. Um, um, that is for my practice, but I check that email regularly, and it's probably the best way to actually get a hold of me. Um, so we're going to have a look at how we sort of access treatments and substance use disorders in, 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 in South Africa. But I think before we get into that, we've got to, I think, set the stage and maybe just explain a little bit of the framework and the difficulties that we have. So we've got this um, separation of powers when it comes to management of substance use disorders. And we've got two different government departments that kind of want the same thing, 
but operates in parallel instead of combining their streams together. And on one hand, we've got the Department of Social Development, who have been mandated, and it is their task, to deal with the use of substances and the addictions that go with substance use disorders. And in fact, that is sort of where the bulk of treatments, in fact, um, in, in, in non-private treatments, um, actually lies in South Africa. It's mostly done by the Department of Social Development, at social offices, by social workers. So where does health come in? You know, and me as a doctor, where do I come in? Well, we normally deal, the Department of Health has got a particular mandate to deal with the consequences of substance use disorders, whether that is depression, suicide attempts, psychosis, admissions into hospital, loss of workplace productivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So on one hand, we've got um, these sort of rehabilitation centers that are run by the Department of Social Development, but they can't manage people that have got a psychiatric illness. So those patients don't really fit very well into the substance use program. And at the same time, the Department of Health has got these hospitals where we can keep people, and more often than not, it's involuntarily at Falkenberg until such time the person is well enough to go home. But there's no very clear rehabilitation program running at Falkenberg Hospital, I promise you. There's just not enough time, there's not enough resources, there's just not enough of many, many things in order to facilitate that. So we we often stuck, you know, I often get calls saying this person is not suitable for a rehab, what can you do for him? And I, and I have to say, well, if the person doesn't have access to private health care or, or, or medical aids, then we're kind of stuck between two very large rocks. And it's sometimes quite um, a difficult thing to say to people. But that being said, we're, we're lucky in the Western Cape at least to have a sort of more functional interface um, and cross sort of departmental collaboration between the Department of Social Development and the Department of Health. And I think a perfect example of that is this um, postgraduate diploma in addictions care that runs at UCT. So this is um, facilitated by UCT and convened by doctors who are employed by health. But the funding of the diploma, the funding of the bursaries, and the entire running costs of this diploma, which, which, which comes close to about 2 million rand a year, is paid for entirely by the Department of Social Development in a grant that's been awarded to UCT. So this is a really, really good way of us making connections between these two different departments. Whether this is happening in other provinces or not, I'm not really sure, but certainly when you go to national meetings um, in Johannesburg and in Pretoria, the impression I get is that health and social development are still very much existing in their own silos. So it makes it very, very difficult um, when planning treatments around substance use disorders because who's actually going to do it? And at the end of the day, if someone's going to do it, someone's going to pay for it. So is it the Department of Social Development that's going to pay? Or is it the Department of Health that's going to pay? You know, I prefer the Department of Health pay because they got a clean audit, and uh, I don't think DSD have ever received a clean audit. No, I'm, I'm serious. So, at least there's that advantage to health, but um, the Department of Social Development is far larger than the Department of Health. It really dwarfs the Department of Health, and they really do have quite a lot of sort of pull power um, at, 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 at national meetings and what have you. So it can be sometimes very, very frustrating. Um, first of all, having to deal with politicians from one department, then you have to deal with politicians from two departments, and those politicians from two departments don't even know who the hell the other person is. So it's like sometimes you have to do these sort of meet and greet introductions and things, huh? Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so the NGOs um, are funded by the Department of Social Development. Um, so, so they receive their funding from DSD, and uh, DSD puts out sort of calls for funding applications every couple of years or so, um, and most people are awarded a multi-year contract, multi-level contract, but the Department of Health does very, very little funding um, in terms of these type of programs. Yes, yeah, we do, we do liaise quite closely with the NGOs and we've got a good working relationship with the NGOs in terms of setting up referral pathways. Um, but sometimes the NGOs are very ill-equipped um, in terms of managing with some of the, the problems that actually get referred to them. That probably should be referred to health, but health don't really have the resources to, or the infrastructure to manage with them. What about the third leg, the police and correctional services? Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's that as well, and um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've still really 
don't really know how we're going to manage this is to address this issue of criminalization, decriminalization, how we treat people who have substance use disorders, whether we must put them into prison, whether we must put them into rehab, and how do we even get to talk. And I must say that I've had very, very little contact with um, correctional services, and really my only experience with the police has been when they've um, in most cases compromise the health and safety of my patients. So I try and, 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 and sort of be as open-minded as, as, as possible, but you know, I wonder what is going to be the watershed moment for the Department of Correctional Services for them to sort of turn the corner and start having these discussions with us, because um, from talking to the policemen on the ground, um, it's very clear that they, that, 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 that they are their fingers are really not on, the, they're feeling for a pulse over here um, when it comes to managing substances. And it's not through their own fault, I think it's really just through their own ignorance. And who do you blame for ignorance? I guess a fish rots from the head. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there will be positive changes in a lot of different departments and we'll have a lot of sort of um, brave people that are open-minded enough to, and brave enough to be able to have these sorts of discussions, I think, at open forums and at open meetings. So luckily, we're having a conference at the beginning of February um, together with all of these departments, really, to have a look at drug policy looking forward to going, going into the UN gas later in this year. So hopefully, we are going to get some representatives from the Department of Social Serv uh, of Correctional Services there um, and some policemen. It will be really nice to see what is the interaction like between the three departments. So. I mean, we, we've, we've touched on this quite quickly, so sort of what is available um, in the public sector, and maybe just to start with the link on the bottom, I don't know if people can actually see it very much, um, uh, it's, it's, it's westerncapital.gov.za slash directory slash facilities slash 736, it's a long thing to remember, but if you basically just Google substance treatment facilities Western Cape, It'll be the first or second hit that, 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 that comes up on Google. And they've actually got a very good list of about 40 to 50 um, mostly public um, and NGO um, facilities sort of all around the Western Cape and telephone numbers and contact details and everything like that. So it's a really good spot to start if you're looking for a resource. So, but sort of looking specifically what might be available as I've mentioned, the DSD is doing a lot of the work here with it. So the social Department of Social Development will have local district offices in many districts, in fact, in most districts. And it seems that about 50 to 60% of people who attend at social development offices actually attend for substance-related issues, whether as a primary problem or sort of as a secondary problem. Um, the advantage and disadvantage here is that these offices are very well staffed. They are well staffed by social workers and that can be an advantage and a disadvantage to, in, in, in one hand as well in that the undergraduate social development curriculum is good, it's comprehensive, however it really doesn't address the clinical aspects of managing with substance use disorders particularly well and it's a sort of really big gap um, in the undergraduate social development training. And quite often, these are very difficult patients, quite challenging patients who test boundaries. And quite often, the um, social workers lack the skill and expertise and necessary supervision um, in order to manage these problems effectively. But nevertheless, it's a good starting point. And the great thing there is that those social workers are very well versed in other referral pathways and how to connect these patients to a physician, to a rehabilitation center, or even to a court if, if necessary. Um, but most of the treatment, in fact, is delivered by non-governmental organizations and these other things called CEOs, which are community-based organizations. So sort of by definition and by name, um, these are um, in, they, they, they're non-governmental organizations, but they rely heavily, quite heavily on funding um, in most cases, 100% on external funding um, in order to actually sort of be functional and get up and running. Um, and I'll show you a list of some of the places that we've got. Um, and there are some places that we refer to at Critter Secure Hospital. The problem with the NGOs is that there's um, no consistency, I guess, in terms of approach to substance use disorders. So you'll have some NGOs that take a very sort of rational, reasonable harm reduction approach um, to substances where relapse is accepted as being normal and part of the journey. And at the same time, you'll have other non-governmental organizations that um, say if you relapse once, you're off the program, cheers. And um, there, there's, 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 there's no sort of consistency, I guess, in terms of how we really apply the theory into practice. And then at the same time, you've got other non-government organizations that for some reason are still able to operate, um, such as NOPUT, which is in, I think, the Northern Cape near Da'ar, 
Um, to my knowledge, they are still a registered facility and they do receive funding from the government, but no put has been in the news for about 10 or 15 years with sort of allegations of patients being physically abused. Um, there have been a couple of uh, deaths that have occurred at Noput, and a very good friend of mine actually who um, grew up with me in Durban um, escaped from Noput and basically took a train to Durban and let me know when he was in Durban and basically the stories that he tells me were, it's absolutely horrendous. Um, people were restrained to beds, people were sort of not given any medication, people were sort of starved and punished by withholding of meals. At Christmas time his mother sent him a whole load of really nice gifts but they confiscated all of the gifts, donated it by themselves to Noput and gave him a Bible instead. So it's, 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 a, it's a very very controversial place and there was a place also, I don't think it was registered, it was in the Western Cape, it was called Al Falaka. It was a um, faith based Islamic um, rehabilitation facility where patients were sort of beaten on the bottom of their feet with, 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 with sticks. And we had a couple of people run away and actually arrive at Kritiske Hospital and a lot of crisis saying, like, please like, help us get, get us out of that place. So I think just because it's an NGO and just because it gets funding, doesn't mean it's going to be the best place for that particular person or for that particular patient. So I think doing a little bit of research, um, asking around, asking people that are working within the field um, might help give some sort of guidance. And, and often the type of intervention needs to fit the patient, and the patient also needs to fit the intervention. So it's a case of sort of looking at what is that particular person's needs and what can be provided by this institution and is it going to be sufficient. So we've got that. We've got our, our social development local offices. We've got our NGOs. And we've also got our support groups. So we mentioned a little bit about this yesterday. So we've got Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. There's innumerable um, meeting sites and meeting places all around the Greater Cape Town Metropole. Um, it's, it, it's very hard to go, in fact, anywhere in the world and not have access to an AA group or an NA group. So it's that sort of universal applicability and accessibility that I think is another good advantage of AA and NA. There's also Al-Anon and Naranon, which is similar to AA and NA, but these are reserved for family members of people that are dealing themselves with substance use disorders. And it provides a really good social support structure um, for families that quite often are really at their wit's end and just need a little bit of holding and a little bit of comforting. And then we've also got Alateen and Naratine, and this is for children um, and adolescents that are existing in a household where there is substance use. And it once again provides a very safe, um, comfortable space where they can express how they are feeling and they can engage with peers that may or may not be having similar experiences to them. So, in a way, the public sector is fairly well um, set up, although if we didn't have NGOs um, or CBOs, I, th I think, I think we'd, be, we'd, we'd really be staring at a very, very large cliff face that we would have no hope of scaling. So we're very, very, very reliant on these NGOs, and it's why we have to, as Department of Health, maintain very good contact and good relationships with these organizations. This is also really, really cool as well, and uh, this is something that's unique to the city of Cape Town, and it's a great thing about being in Cape Town, is that there's these, there's these really cool, new, innovative approaches to, to managing certain problems. And um, you can access this again uh, just from the Cape Town website, or if you Google Matrix Rehabilitation Cape Town, it will also like be the first or second site that pops up on Google. And this is an um, internationally based model of managing substance use disorders. Um, that was sort of designed in the United States and was designed initially specifically for stimulants for methamphetamine use disorders. And it's a 16-week intensive outpatient program. So by that we mean the patients attend every single day, uh, Monday to Friday, for those 16 weeks, for a number of hours per day. So someone really needs to commit um, to it, and it's intensive. And the great thing is that um, it's free. It costs nothing. The city will pay for it. So I think this is a really, really good and important draw card for people. Um, there is sometimes a waiting list, but in order to compensate for that, the city of Cape Town has opened up centres at different areas. We've got now in Milnitz and Delft, Kailicha, Manenberg, Parkwood and Tafelsif, which is in Mitchell's plan. So these sites are popping up everywhere and more and more people are accessing them. And I've had really, really good experiences with um, the Matrix sites um, simply because of the intensity of the, inter of the intervention. It's not only individual sessions. 
It's conjoint sessions with family members. It's looking at early recovery, which is often a very, very high risk period for relapse. It's looking at specifically relapse prevention groups, so skills that people can learn to implement to sort of resist saying yes or to resist going back to the same way that things were. Um, as I've mentioned, there's family psychoeducation groups, and at the same time, there's also social support sessions. And the great thing is that even though this model has been designed for stimulants, it has been sort of adapted um, for use for any drugs, in fact. So for alcohol, uh, for cannabis, for um, opioid use disorders, for, me for methamphetamine, pretty much anything. Um, and the great thing about it as well is that it's evidence-based. So this intervention has been subjected to randomized trials and it's been shown to be better than treatment as usual or any other intervention um, that it was compared to. So there's good evidence supporting this. Um, and it's something, you know, I always keep sort of this web page and normally the numbers on me, but uh, I don't have my diary with me, but it's like just something to, to, to always say to people, here's a one page, here's what you need. You know, if you need something, you don't even need a referral letter, you just phone them and they set up an appointment. Um, which, is, which, is, which makes it really, really easy uh, for people to get into treatment. We've also got our public hospitals. Um, so I'm not sure about the other hospitals because you know, I'm based at Critter's Care Hospital, but we have an outpatient dual diagnosis clinic. Um, so that really is for people with a mental health problem and a substance use disorder. Um, the referrals can't be self-referrals. Because Critter's Care is a tertiary or quaternary <coughs> level hospital, um, all referrals need to be done by another healthcare provider. So that can be a GP, it can be a psychologist, um, it can be a social worker, but it's not a walk-in facility, unfortunately. Um, there's a little bit of a waiting list at the moment as well, but such is the nature of Critter's Care Hospital. Um, but the telephone number is there if anyone would like any information. Um, you can just call that number. It's 404-2151, um, and that's the main reception, and they'll be able to help. Um, and then Stickland Hospital, which is based out in, 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 uh, in Belleville, or Stickland, um, they are, to my knowledge, the only um, inpatient alcohol rehabilitation unit in the province, and also the only inpatient opioid detoxification <laughs> unit in the province. Um, so... There's two different conditions, I guess. There. For, so for the alcohol rehabilitation unit, it's self-referral only. You can't be referred in by someone else. You have to refer yourself, um, which is often the sort of most difficult thing for people is to sort of pick up the phone and take that first step. But the best way to do it is, you know, if I'm sitting with a patient in my office, I, I dial the number and I give the phone to them there and then um, if they want it. Because oftentimes people will say, yeah, 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 I, I do. I'm, I'm, I'll do it later, I'll do it later this evening, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, and they might want to and they might have that intention, but you know, by saying to someone, well, why don't you do it now, here's the phone, they're on the line. There's sometimes a good way of someone actually sort of saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, I'm gonna try this, okay. Um, the great thing here is that they sort of do the whole detox and they do the rehabilitation as well. Um, it's a very sort of well-functioning unit. It's headed up by a very, very skilled and talented um, addiction psychiatrist, Dr. Lisa Weich. And um, th they've also got an inpatient opioid detoxification unit. So also to the best of my knowledge, and I speak under correction, this appears to be the sort of only um, state-funded opioid detox unit, it seems, in the Western Cape. I'm not sure about the rest of the country. Um, however, they are only able to detox. So it only t it takes about seven days. So once again, it's self-referral. Um, it can be referred in by a healthcare provider as well, but you've got to have a rehabilitation program that you are going into after the detox, either an outpatient program or an inpatient program. And I think that the, 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 there's a good reason and a rationale for that, simply in that, um, Detox is the first step, and it's about maintaining um, that detox if that is where that person wants to be at that particular point in time. That's the most challenging. And when it comes to medication, medication for opioid um, use disorders, AST, is in many cases prohibitively expensive um, for, for, for many patients. And there is a collaboration between Stickland Hospital and an NGO based in Mitchell's plan called Sultan Bahu, where um, Sultan Bahu are able to, with external funding, provide opioid substitution medication to the patients for a time-limited period only. So at least it's something. So something is changing and something is moving, but these medications are for a large part prohibitively expensive, not only for the patients, but also for the state. Then in the private sector, it's sort of somewhat different. Yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah. We work quite closely with them with, with, uh, with the diploma. Um, 
sort of everything is good and bad, I guess, but overall the experience has been has been positive. Yeah, I had a positive experience with them. So in the private sector, we've got sort of these facilities that are sort of both private and public. Um, that are these subsidised facilities for Hesketh King, Ramot, and Tuflach. And there's a number of private facilities that are um, around and about in Cape Town. Um, there's very many, in fact, um, including Horizons, Minnesota Oasis, um, Stepping Stones, and Kenilworth. They actually got bought out by the Akeso Group, um, and the Akeso Group have just built a new hospital out in Milnerton, where I'm practicing from. And they've got um, quite a sort of well-structured inpatient rehabilitation program. Not yet running up at Milnerton, but it's going to be happening quite soon. Um, and they've got quite a lot of experience with managing with, um, I guess, medical aids and sort of dealing with those particular types of challenges. And I think that's a good advantage because sometimes dealing with medical aids can be very, very difficult and very, very challenging. So when it comes to private sector, people say, well, I mean, how do I afford it? The stuff is really expensive, and that's true. Most people without medical aids wouldn't be able to afford the cost of public of private health care. It really is a sort of quite a perverse system. Um, that I'm a part of, unfortunately, you know. But what people don't know is, what many people don't know is that anyone with a medical aid, you've got your PMBs, your prescribed minimum benefits. And these are benefits, these are conditions that medical aids are obligated to pay for under the Medical Schemes Act. It's like an all-inclusive Mauritius type of holiday. You know, they'll pay for your bed, they'll pay for your food, they'll pay for your medication, they'll pay for your, um, your psychiatrist, they'll pay for everything. But unfortunately, they're quite, they're quite clear in their policy documents. So discovery, say yes, we'll give you 21 days inpatient care as part of your PMBs, but please bear in mind that addiction is actually an exclusion criteria for many of their claims. So what they're saying is that we're going to pay for your 21 days, but don't ask us for any more um, because we're not going to give you any money, because we actually, sh we, we actually don't feel like we should be giving you any money for this, but we have to because of this act. So, you know, the, 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 the medical schemes are stuck in between a rock and a hard place, and I think it's good, because there at least is something to be done. Whether 21 days of inpatient care is actually sufficient enough for people to really overcome their addiction, um, I really have my reservations about that. I really don't think it's enough. We seem to need like 90 days or maybe even longer. And what I think is more important is we need outpatient management, but the medical aides, unfortunately, are not willing to pay for outpatient management. So it's quite often you've got to really, really try very, very hard to convince them that this person would benefit from it. Um, so as I said, they're not all schemes cover outpatient management, and so not all schemes cover pharmacotherapy either. Some schemes do, but, but the, obviously the more you pay, the more cover you get, but for sort of most entry-level medical aids, which I'm on, 1,300 rand, 1,500 rand a month, you only get your 21 days inpatient care. But at least it's obligatory. They have to do it. They cannot refuse. And I think for people that are really, really at their wit's end, sometimes taking them out of the environment that they were in that got to them in that situation can sometimes be a healing process in and of itself. Whether it's enough to completely band-aid the entire problem or not is another question altogether. But we certainly make use of this quite a lot. Um, and um, most people that are admitted to private medical facilities for addiction problems um, are doing so under the PMBs. So if you'd like any more information about that stuff or you need any clarification, please please email me and I'll send you what I've got. And then just quickly, this is court orders. Um, so I've actually got two slides, but I mean, I'll basically just say that under this Prevention and Treatment for Substance Abuse Act of 2008, this legislation does make provision for diversions and committals of patients with, with, with substance use disorders. And really a diversion is essentially comes up after a person has been charged criminally and it's a way for that charge to sort of be put on the back burner and most likely withdrawn under provision, with the provision that that person is admitted to and successfully completes a rehabilitation program. Um, these sorts of applications are normally sort of referred to the courts by parents, courts or family members or social workers themselves. There's a little bit of a process that in includes an affidavit, an assessment and an affidavit, liaising with the legal representative, going to court, allowing the person that you are, uh, that you are sort of wanting to divert to provide their own representation in court to make their own sort of arguments for and against. Um, and then once the court is satisfied that a rehabilitation centre has been found and a date has been found for rehabilitation for, for admission, then the court will say, okay, great. You've got to go to this facility on this particular day, and on condition of that, your charge of theft or your charge of housebreaking, for example, will be withdrawn. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a good way to an extent of avoiding that pejorative label of being a criminal or of having a criminal record um, from people. Most of this is facilitated by social workers and mostly social workers in private practice. Um, committal is sort of somewhat different 
different. Um, committal is really a referral from a public prosecutor, social worker, concerned family member, close associate, anyone really who is able to demonstrate a invested, consistent, um, marked interest in the well-being of someone else. So I could, for example, apply for uh, my wife. Yeah, and I, not that I'm saying I will. She's totally. She doesn't use any substances. But it would sort of, <laughs> hypothetically, you know, if she were using substances to the point where her safety was compromised, her health was compromised, my health or my safety was compromised, or she was neglecting the responsibilities to our children, for example, or she was not attending work and was not um, sort of filling her work-related obligations, you could then make an application um, to the court via a social worker to say this is the story. This person is so severely affected by their substance use disorders that they need an involuntary admission into a rehabilitation center. And I think I didn't mention that earlier, but most of these admissions are voluntary. You go because you want to. If you leave, you leave because you want to. No one can keep you there. So under a committal, it's really the court saying that you are going to be involuntarily committed to this rehabilitation center um, by a court order. And whether this is beneficial or not, you, we could really debate that, um, but I think in certain situations you have to use all of the resources available. And when people are really at the end of their at the end of their tether and really don't have anything, any other options, when health has closed their door, when outpatient treatment has closed their door, but they're still living with this person, I think this can sometimes be a useful tool and a useful way to get that person into treatment. However, that being said. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So if you force someone into a rehab, it's unlikely that that person is going to maintain sobriety afterwards, although it doesn't happen all the time. You know, sometimes there are success stories, but it's quite often a case of you spend the three weeks actually convincing the person that they need to be there. And by the time that they finally said, yes, I need to be here, it's, game, it's time up, game over, you've, you've, you, you've got to go home. Um, so there's, there's, there's that problem, I guess, as well um, with committal. But it is something to be aware of and something that can be facilitated through a social worker. Um, and then this is also just another resource. It's quite a long link. Um, I'll leave it up maybe and then you can take photos or write it down or whatever. But once again, if you just Google that, Resource and Services Directory, except blah, 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 blah. Um, this was only it was published four years ago. It hasn't been updated, updated yet, but it's a really nice like 20 page PDF. You can keep on your tablet, you can keep on your phone, on your computer and whatever. And it's a really good, like fairly up to date resource directory of what can I do, where can I go, who can I speak to, what if, X, Y, and Z. Um, and this is sort of one of, well, like I said, you know, a great thing about working in the Western Cape and that there are at least these initiatives to try and make a difference. Whether it's making a meaningful difference yet or not, um, only time will tell, I think. But really what would, in my opinion, make the most meaningful difference, and this is a question that was asked yesterday, I think really what would make the most meaningful difference to me and help me do my job um, and facilitate me doing my job would be for us to have a look at how we classify drugs of abuse and whether it is of any public health interest whatsoever to have these drugs classified as being illegal because realistically it only makes my job more difficult and my job is difficult enough as it is um, and I think anyone who's a clinician in, in, in the audience would uh, and has been working in this field I hope will agree with me so really on that note um, I, I'll come to an end um, I think everyone's got my email address please email me if there's any queries questions comments concerns or anything like that. And yeah, I mean, if there's any questions, please feel free. Um, anyone wants to ask anything? Sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. No put. I don't even know how No put is, is still operating. The, um, it's basically a farm. Yeah, exactly. And no, if you go to No Put's website, they make these claims like guaranteed cure, 100%, or your money back, and all this, all this nonsense. And um, it's absolute garbage. It would need to be reported, I guess, to the departments in that particular province. So it would need to go to the Northern Cape Department of Social Development because that's where NOPUT is. So I mean, that's a little bit, ugh, you know. But I think maybe for um, the Western Cape, at least, um, all NGOs that get funding from DSD need to submit quarterly progress reports every year in terms of the amount of patients they saw, what they did, what were the outcomes, et cetera, et cetera, according to sort of guidelines set by the DSD. 
Um, and the DSD take complaints and allegations of misconduct very, very seriously against the NGOs because it's their money that's going to waste. So if you are concerned about the functioning or the licensing of any facility, you could liaise with the DSD. Um, they've got a special directorate division that deals with substance use disorders. Uh, oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, no, I think they would. Um, I know if I were giving an NGO two million rand a year and they were doing some really funny things and compromising the health and safety of my patients, I would really want to take those people to task and make sure they don't get any more funding going, going forwards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.